I uh, hope everybody's having a great day today, New Spring Church. Clap your hands if you're happy to be here, huh? Man, it's a great day to be in church. Welcome to week two of No Other Name. My name is Brad Cooper. I'm one of the pastors on staff. If we've not gotten the chance to meet, my role is I get to work with our Kids Spring and our Fuse Ministries. That's our 18 and unders. And, uh, and I just want to celebrate with you guys. Since 2014's been here, we've been basically averaging every single week between the attendance in Kids Spring and the attendance at Fuse on Wednesday nights on all of our campuses, we've been averaging around 10,000 young people in attendance every single week. Is that not incredible? Man, God is doing a great thing in our church. So that's where I primarily get to hang out. But every once in a while, I get to come up here and give an, a, a, an opportunity for Pastor Perry, who is in Israel today, by the way. He just got done baptizing his daughter in the Jordan River. So you guys that are following him on social media, uh, you can keep up with all of that. And he'll be back soon to continue this series. But man, we are so, so, so excited about this No Other Name series. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But I've just got to celebrate with you guys because I just told you about Pastor Perry and his daughter. Well, I've got some massive news in my world. My wife and I just had the birth of our very first less than a month ago and I wanted you guys to see her so yeah sorry it's one of those things parents you understand what I'm saying I, I was at the grocery store yesterday and I'm checking out and the gal that was back in my grocery goes you're the, you're the dad that takes the pictures with the daughter on and I was like, yeah I'm sorry so listen hey listen if you don't want if you don't want that don't follow me on social media because I'm going to take pictures of my kid hello anyway this is Campbell and uh, she's at home with mom today and I told my wife before I left the house this morning I, I said you my wife moms you know what I'm talking about are going to do the harder thing today than what I'm going to go do I'm here getting to hang out and preach but my wife what she is doing as a mom the strength that that has taken and what I am seeing it's giving me a whole new appreciation for gals and so can we put our hands together for all the moms out there love you moms propers to you guys man so cool well, listen, in this series, this No Other Name series, we're kind of rallying around the truth in Acts 4.12. And about this, the, the truth is there's no other name um, given under heaven that, that men could be saved, the name of Jesus. And this is what this series is about. And this is the series that's going to carry us as a church up into the Easter season. And so this series is about we as a people getting ready for Easter. And so I started to think about, hey, how can we get ready for Easter? Pastor Perry kind of prompted me with this sermon, say, how do we get our people? people ready for Easter? How can we as an individual and us as a collective body, how do we get ready for Easter? And so I want to ask a question to get us going today. Here's the question I want to ask is how would Jesus have us prepare for Easter? How would Jesus have us prepare for Easter? Because we all know this, right? There's no other name that represents Easter other than Jesus, right? We do a lot of things to get prepared for Easter season in American culture. I, uh, I've been running a lot to like CVS and Walgreens here lately on like honeydew trips, right? Pick up the Pampers or grab this or grab that and go, go get this prescription. And one of the things I know at Walgreens and CVS right now, they're getting ready for Easter, specifically Easter baskets. And they've got candy everywhere, right? All this pastel colored candy, Robin eggs, can I get an amen for a robin egg? What's up? Um, not any peeps, you know, that's not really my thing. But, you know, chocolate covered eggs and, and, and chocolate covered bunnies, and they're getting ready for Easter. If you go to the mall and you, and you look at all of the new clothes for spring, they're getting ready for Easter, aren't they? Some of you, you got the memo. You're here today in bright colors, and you've got on your pinks and your pastels and your blues and all of this. You're getting ready for Easter. Uh, in the south here, in the deep south of South Carolina, there's some men who you are getting ready for Easter. And the way you get ready for Easter is your seersuckers are pressed, right? They're getting ready. You're getting prepared for Easter. Or you're a frat daddy, one or the other. You're getting ready for Easter. But how do we as a church get ready for Easter? How do we prepare for Easter? And so I thought I would try to get our minds wrapped around one thing because we can get caught in a lot of things. But here's what Easter's all about. I think you'll agree. Easter equals resurrection. Doesn't it? That's what Easter's about. The reason that we celebrate Easter, the whole point of Easter is, is, is resurrection life, specifically that of Jesus Christ, right? God himself came, took on flesh, became incarnate. Jesus Christ took on all the sin of the world, died on a cross, was buried and was resurrected. And that's what Easter is all about. So I'm here to remind us today, church, on every campus in every city or listening online or wherever you are, that this is what Easter is about. Easter is about resurrection. 
And if you didn't get that, maybe this will help you even more. This is a picture that Pastor Perry left off with last week of, uh, of a tomb in Israel today. Um, and many think that, the, that Jesus would have been buried in a tomb very similar to this, if not this tomb itself. And, and this is a picture of resurrection. The reason it's a picture of resurrection, because as you can see, even though it's just 2D, it's not 3, that thing's empty. He's not there, right? You poke your head in. I have, by the way. You poke your head in, and there's a sign inside of that tomb that says, He is risen. He is not there this morning, church. And so this is a really good thing. Yeah, I mean, we get excited about that. But this is what Easter is about. This is why we sing. This is why we gather. This is why we have hope. This is why we smile. This is why we get together on Sundays and, and fellowship. All over the world, churches around the globe are doing what we're doing today on our campuses. And they're lifting up the name of Jesus because this is what Easter is all about. So if we're going to ask the question on every campus, how do we prepare for Easter, I think we've got to ask the question question is how do we prepare for resurrection? Isn't that the question we're asking? How do we prepare for resurrection? And if this was the, the movie scene from, the, from Jesus's life, then I think what we've got to understand is what was the prequel to this scene? How did Jesus Christ prepare for that? How does Jesus Christ prepare for resurrection? And I think this statement does it. It was a cross. Because where there is no cross, there is no resurrection. Is that right? Where there is no death, there can be no resurrection life. And so we can get excited today about resurrection. We can, get, we can get really amped up about Easter. We can get amped up about he is risen. And we can get really excited about that with our lips. But I want to challenge you, and the Lord challenged me, that if I am going to prepare my heart for resurrection, not just on Easter, but on every day, because that's what all of life is about, is that, hey, Jesus died, was buried, but was resurrected. And so we, as Christians, we hope for that in our own lives. How did Jesus Christ prepare for resurrection? and it led him directly through the path of the cross. So let me tell you who this sermon is going to impact this morning. One, if you're a Christian, you need to lean in. You need to listen because Jesus has something for you today on all of our campuses because that's how he prepared for resurrection. Two, if you're here today and you're going through any kind of hardship in life, maybe something in home, with your family, in a relationship, at work, maybe a tough semester, a tough, um, you know, so whatever's going on that's tough, what you need to understand is that Jesus has been in the business of taking tough things, even, even death itself, and turning it on its head and making it a great thing, a good thing, a glorious thing, a praiseworthy thing. So if you have been or are going through or think you might go through something tough in life at any point in your life, then today's message is going to be for you. But I need to reiterate, you do not get resurrection if there is not a cross. Amen. And you do not get life if there is not death. And so what I thought I would do today is to get us um, ready for this is, is I really began to think about a sermon that Jesus preached himself trying to prepare his disciples and his followers for that resurrection scene. And the, the sermon is from Mark chapter 8, if you've got your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn there. Mark chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 34 and 35. And, and this is going to be in our minds, it's going to make a lot of sense, but I want just to reiterate before we read this together that to the Jewish mind and to the mind of those people people that were catching this firsthand when Jesus spoke it, it was kind of shocking and it was kind of staggering because they weren't sitting like we are in light of retrospective resurrection empty tomb. They were sitting there following Jesus going, what in the world are you talking about, man? I want to understand and they didn't get it. And so I think this sermon that Jesus preached will, was helping his disciples get ready for empty tomb resurrection. And I think it can be what we can be informed with today as we prepare our church and our homes and our individual lives lives for celebrating Easter here in just a couple of weeks. So if you got your Bible, Mark 8, we'll pick it up in verse 34. Here's what Jesus said. He's preaching and he says, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, watch, whoever wants to be my disciple. So I don't know if that's you today. That, that's me. Uh, that would be me. Whoever wants to be my disciple, Christian, okay, must deny themselves and take up their, what's this word on every single campus? Take up their what? Cross, okay. Take up their cross and what? And follow me, all right? Got it. That's what every disciple or every wannabe disciple should be doing. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Y'all look at that. I want you just to let those words sit for a minute because if you believe that Jesus is God and you believe that he speaks only truth, then you need to know that he's making you a promise and he's making me a promise today. And if you and I try to strive and cling to life, he says, whoever wants to save their life, it's gone. 
it's going to go away. And you're not going to get what you want. But, it doesn't end there, there's a comma. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will in fact save it. And so these are the words that Jesus speaks in preparation um, for him going to the cross, but also in preparation for his church and how to prepare them for a resurrection life. And he's saying to them that they have got to be willing to deny themselves and take up their cross. And I know when I say those words, unless you've been raised in church, and then it's going to probably become, um, you know, it's almost like, hey, I've heard that before. That's like coffee cup verse. I've read that before. It's a memory verse I got, you know, when I was a kid. But we don't really have a context today in American culture for what it's like to see people dying upon a cross. Because you didn't drive to church today on whatever campus you're on and, and drive by dozens and dozens of crosses on the way. But in fact, when Jesus spoke these words, that would have been reality for the Jewish mind. And, and, and the Jewish life. They would have seen um, hundreds, thousands, maybe even ten thousands of people in their lifetime under Roman rule having died upon crosses. They were as common as, as, uh, as you know, stop signs or street lights going down the road. It was a statement by the governing Roman rule that they would not stand for anybody who would be rebellious to Roman rule or anybody that was going to be a criminal and cause a stirring and an uprising. And so people that were criminals died upon crosses, people that cre you know, created you know, insurrections and rebellions against Caesar and Rome, they died upon crosses. And, and so it was very commonplace. And so Jesus Christ stands up before us today and he says, hey, if you want to be my disciple... If you want to be a Christian, you've got to be willing to say no to self and take up a cross and follow me. Follow me because I'm going to lead the way. I'm going to show you how you get to that empty tomb. I'm going to show you how you get to resurrection life. I'm going to show you how you get to that kind of joy and that kind of celebration. But you've got to be willing to say yes to carrying a cross, embracing a cross, inviting a cross into your life. So with that, just like any good youth pastor, I figured, man, i got to give you guys an illustration. So hold on a second. Got to stay hydrated for this one, okay? So I've got this old wooden lectern up here, but today it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us a visual illustration of what it might be like. And we're going to make just a couple of statements about what it's like, what a life is like that says yes to resurrection life, that says yes to carrying a cross. And so the first thing, if you're taking notes today, I'd love for you to write down is that carrying a cross is going to be noticeable. Would you write that down this morning? Would you write it down? Carrying a cross is going to be noticeable, right? You're not going to be sneaking around with one of these on your back. Am I right? You, when you carry a cross, you're going to be noticed by those around you. The people in your world, you want to be a Christian? You want to say yes to Jesus? You want to follow after him? You want to say yes to losing your life now to gain your life in eternity? You're going to be noticed. The way you handle your money, it's going to be noticed. The way you speak, people are going to listen to the way you speak because it's going to be noticed in stark contrast to those around you. Single folks, where are my single folks at on every campus? Raising your hands right here. Go ahead and raise your hand. Look around. I'll give you a chance to look around. You can peek. See if she's single. He's single. Single folks, come on now. Participate. Don't get all embarrassed. All right. Single folks that you say, yes, I'm willing to follow Jesus. The way you date's going to be noticeable. Young men, single young men, the way you date her is going to be noticeable. The way you spend your weekends, college crowd, it's going to be noticeable. It's going to stand out. Hey, mom and dad, you say yes to Jesus, you're going to be noticed in your neighborhood. The way you drive in traffic, road ragers, what's up, road ragers? The way you drive in traffic, it's not going to be noticed for the wrong things, but for the right things. The way you are at Publix or Ingles or at Piggly Wiggly. I think they're closing Piggly Wiggly. It broke my heart the other day when I found that out. When you go to buy groceries and you make your way through the checkout line, it's going to be noticeable when you say yes to carrying a cross. Did we get the point across? When you pick up one of these, people are going to take notice. Number two today that I want you to write down. Number two today is it's going to be noticeable, but it's going to be uncomfortable. Let me go ahead and uh, tell you something right now. This thing right here, it's a lot lighter than a cross, but... It's not comfortable. It's not comfortable. You pick up one of these, you're saying yes to being in a constant state of discomfort. You see, Christians find out how to live a life that is okay being in a constant state of discomfort. 
That's what a Christian says yes to. They say, hey, I'm okay being uncomfortable. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live my life differently on a budget so that I can say yes to living my wallet towards Jesus in a Godward way. That's gonna be a little more uncomfortable than maybe the other folks down the street, and I'm okay with that. Oh, it's gonna be different to date in college or as a young adult or the kind of pursuits I take. I'm not gonna just go after a job because it pays well. I'm gonna go after a job because I've got a higher calling in my life. That might make it a little bit more uncomfortable than other folks around me, and I am saying, yes, I am okay with that. Is that okay with anybody today, by the way? I'm okay with that. As a dad, as a father, as a husband, men, look at me in the eyes. I'm saying yes to being a little bit uncomfortable about the way I lead versus the other folks that I see around my world, and it's not because I am um, holier than thou. It's because I've said yes to Jesus Christ and carrying his cross because I'm living a resurrection life. That's what I'm doing, and I'm going to say yes to being uncomfortable. It's going to be a little uncomfortable when you go to, to uh, you know, again, when you go to your careers, your jobs, your, your conversations, your dating, again, your bank account, it's going to be uncomfortable. Where you live, what you take on versus what you don't, man, there's a lot of things in life you could do, but saying yes to Jesus is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, as you just saw me do, you might have to make some changes in your life in order to say yes to Jesus. If you're going to say yes to being uncomfortable, you might have to make some changes in your life. Because that's what carrying a cross might require. That's the second one. Noticeable, uncomfortable. The third thing that I think you guys and I need to write down is that, that it's incredibly personal. It's incredibly personal. Carrying a cross is incredibly personal. You see, one cross for one person. That's it. That's the math. One cross for one person. Someone who's been working with students for the last several years, one of the conversations that we have a lot in student ministry is that at some point in your life, mom and dad's faith, big brother, big sister's faith, your small group leader's faith, you have to own your own faith. And you've got to make a decision before you go off to college, before you step into the adult world, the dating world, the career world. It can't be about just showing up and, and just kind of falling into the cultural scene of church world in the South and just leaning in on your, your knowledge of your pastor's faith or your parents' faith. You've got to say yes to your personal decision to take up your cross. It's got to be deeply, deeply personal. Carrying your cross is a personal thing. You never saw five and six people dying on one cross. You saw one person on one cross. It was a personal thing. And so Jesus, as he preaches a sermon to us today, how do you prepare for Easter? You've got to take some personal responsibility. Hey, look at me in the eyes, every single campus. I want you to take some personal responsibility for how you prepare for Easter. I believe that's what God has for you. How are you preparing? Not how is your family preparing or how are your friends? How are you preparing for Easter? How are you preparing for God's resurrection work in your own life? Is it personal to you today? Because the Lord's saying it should be and it could be. This could be the message that begins to change all of that. One, it was noticeable. Two, it was uncomfortable. Three, it was personal. Four, it's permanent. Four, carrying a cross is permanent. Now, again, we don't have cultural context for this here in America because we didn't, you know, come to church today driving by people on crosses. And when you leave, you won't go by and see anybody carrying one of these up and down the road. But what I want you to know that every one of his listeners knew when Jesus spoke these words in Mark 8 is that every person they had ever seen, let me make you a promise, every person they had ever seen carrying a cross did not come back down from that cross. It was permanent. There is a, 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 a candid, frank permanence to coming and following Jesus. That's why he tells us to count the cost. It is for life. It is for the rest of your life. So whether you make the decision young or old or anywhere in between, it is permanent. They saw people carrying crosses up hills all over cities in all of Israel. In any of the Roman towns, they would carry these things up hills and they would die upon those hills. And yes, Jesus, he carried one of these up a hill called Golgotha, literally meaning the place of the skull, and it was permanent for him too there. He laid down his life upon that cross. And again, we'll celebrate it here in just a couple of weeks at Easter, but it's more than just an Easter day. It's a life that says, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. I believe that, hey, I'm saying yes to carrying a cross. In my life, it's gonna be permanent. So again, there's gonna be noticeable differences. There's gonna be uncomfortable things. There's gonna be personal things. There's gonna be permanent things. But the last thing I want you to write down today is I want you to write down this. I want you to write down that it's public. 
public. And I want you to think about what you've seen in movies or what you've thought of when you thought of Jesus dying upon a cross. But it did not happen in a dungeon in some walls uh, where nobody saw it. It happened on the highest places and spaces of Roman rule. It happened where all of the city could see it. It happened on the, the highways and the byways. Rome wanted to send a point. They wanted to make something exceedingly clear. You mess with Roman authority and you will pay this price. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, he made a public statement. But it was bigger than just a hey, Roman authority. He was making a public statement that he would be willing to take on the sin and the shame of all of the universe and die the punishment that we all deserved on a cross publicly, publicly. He did it in front of people. Here in just a little bit on every single campus, we're gonna give an opportunity for invitation. And you, if you say yes to following Jesus today, you will make this decision publicly. Amen. There will be people that see it. There will be folks that notice it, and that is okay. That is why we baptize. We don't baptize with the lights off around here. We do it with the lights on and we make it a big deal because folks are going public with their decision to follow Jesus. They're going public. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. We're going public. And that's what we're doing today is we're okay in saying yes to it being noticed in our communities that we're following Jesus. We're saying yes, not just on Sundays when we gather together, but on Mondays when we go to schools and to work and in our homes. We're saying yes to living uncomfortable lives, for, for sacrificing things that other people might go, that's strange, that's weird, that, that don't, I don't understand that. But when they see your life is lived in a Godward way and they look at your life in light of that empty tomb we looked at earlier, it will all make sense to them. Amen? They see you and I saying yes to uncomfortable scenarios and situations. They see not relying on other people's faith, but us doing it personally. We're personally making this decision to be permanently attached to Jesus Christ and publicly declare that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and there is no other name that you or I or anyone else can be saved for all of eternity except for the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So with that, I wanted to leave you guys with one more scripture. Because maybe you're saying, how in the world could Jesus have said yes to that? Why would he have said yes to that? And there's a passage in Hebrews that has always informed me. And I thought it was so confusing for years until I thought about it in context to the cross. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. I want to show it to you. I'm going to need your help on every campus. Jesus, this is talking about our Lord. It says, fixing our eyes on him. This is how we are to walk through life, Christian. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I need your help right here. For the, what's this word right here? For the joy set before him endured the, what's the what's word right here? Cross. The joy he endured the cross. It was joy that made Jesus say yes to the cross. It was for joy. Now that doesn't make sense unless you and I know about the empty tomb, right? That's the only reason that would make sense. He didn't just do it because he was looking for punishment or looking to be a martyr. No, no, no. It was the joy set before Jesus at the cross because he knew the empty tomb was on the other side. He knew where there was no death, there could be no life. And he knew where there was no cross, there could be no resurrection. And the same truth he had back then, he's giving to us today. If you want joy in your life, real soul satisfying joy, then you and I have to be willing to say yes to carrying a cross. And let me make sure I make this incredibly clear. You and I do not pick up a cross and carry it because of obligation or duty. It is not our Christian duty or obligation. We're not working for salvation. You're not going to get saved because you say yes to doing all of this effort and work. No, no, no. We're doing it from our salvation, not for our salvation. Jesus has secured it. He has paid for it. He has cleaned the slate of all of our sin, past, present, and future. And when you and I understand what a massive big deal that is for our hearts and for our lives, then we say yes joyfully to carrying the cross in our own lives. And we live lives of resurrection. And we don't just simply have lips of He is risen on Easter. Amen? And that's what this is all about. That's how we can live a resurrection life. We say yes to a cross say yes to carrying a cross. So with all of that in mind today, I'm gonna invite you to do something publicly right here. I wanna invite you on every single campus, if you don't mind, go ahead and stand into your feet. On every single campus, let's go ahead and stand to our feet. And we're gonna close, but we're gonna close in a little bit of a different way. And if you don't have to move, don't have to leave, stay right where you are, that would be awesome. 
And we're going to go into a time of invitation. And this invitation, it's going to be an all swim, okay? What I mean by that is anybody who needs to respond, respond, okay? But I'm going to pray for us that we would be a church individually and collectively that lived lives that prepared for resurrection. Not just at Easter, but, but a resurrection life for all of eternity. And so today, I'm going to invite many of you to be noticed, to go public, to make personal decisions. You are going to say yes to embracing what Christ has purchased for you at the cross. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us. And then in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. One, if you need to say yes to Jesus for the very first time, you've never done that. You may have been in church your whole life, but you've been borrowing your pastor's faith, your parents' faith, your spouse's faith, your kid's faith. People around you may even be shocked that you're going to get out of your aisle, and that's okay. All right, But you are saying today, I'm going to make this personal. I am making this decision to follow Jesus. Because where there is no yes to the cross, you cannot anticipate a yes of resurrection. You understand what I'm saying to you? That's the truth of what Jesus said. Maybe today, you just need prayer. Maybe you've got someone on your heart or on your mind that God has continued to place there. And you, you just need prayer. Maybe something going on at home. Maybe it's a, a dark season right now, relationally, in your job. Maybe medically, some things are going on. And you just need some encouragement today to believe that the best is yet to come. That there is resurrection and there is life, even though right now, and I want you to think about Jesus on his way to the cross. All those disciples and he, Jesus himself, it probably looked pretty grim in those moments, didn't it? But Jesus knew, and he encourages us today, no matter how grim your situation, the Lord can turn any evil for good, and he promises that he will do that. He will do that. And so maybe you need prayer today. I'm going to give you permission in just a little bit to make your way out to the aisle and hit the prayer room, the care room on your campus. Maybe you're a dad, and today in front of your family, publicly, you need to tell them, hey, we're going to live a life that is gonna be about carrying a cross. We're gonna be noticed and we're okay being uncomfortable. We're okay making choices that are personal and permanent and public. Or maybe you're a mom and you're gonna say the same. Or maybe you're a young man or a young woman and you've got your parents sitting here with you and you need to be able to encourage them in the same. But I'm gonna pray for us and we'll give an opportunity for folks to respond on every campus. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this truth. Thank you that there is no other name besides the name of Jesus where the resurrection power for all of us exists. Thank you for paying our sin debt, for dying our death, for taking our punishment on that cross. But thank you for the cross giving all of us today an empty tomb. Thank you for reminding us that where there is no death, there is no life. And so God, would you help us to be a people that begin to say yes to some tough and heavy things on this side of eternity, knowing we can put our trust and our eternity in your resurrection power. And so God, I pray that this Easter would be the most powerful Easter that we've ever experienced personally in our lives. That it would be a massively powerful Easter season for our families and for our homes and for our communities on every single campus. And God, I pray right now for those that are in attendance today that have never said yes to you, uh, Lord, that you would allow them to have the courage to go public today uh, and say yes to you. And, and God, that it's okay to be noticed and it's okay for there to be a little bit of discomfort in this because on the other side of that, that there is a resurrection awaiting them. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed on campuses all across the state of South Carolina, if today you want to say yes to Jesus Christ and you want to respond to the invitation for the first time in your entire life and go public for Him, I'm going to invite you to make your way to an aisle and make your way to the backs of auditoriums all over the state and we've got folks that would love to pray with you, would love to encourage you would love to equip you with how you continue to take your next step Amen, Amen, Amen Continue to move, folks might have to get out of your way and that's okay, it's alright you might get noticed, that's okay it's alright, you might have to ask someone to excuse you while you step across the aisle to get to the care room on your campus and that's okay Dad's not a better way to go public than right here in front of your family. Mom's not a, way, not a better way to lead than right now in front of them to say, right now I'm doing this. My decision, my personal decision, I'm going to go public right here. Amen. Young man, young woman, not a better way to lead and say, hey, I'm, I'm grateful my mom and dad have faith in Jesus, but it's time that I take this decision and make it my own. I'm going to step into the aisle and I'm going to make my way to a care room. I'm not going to lean into my mom and dad's faith. This is my decision. Amen. Amen. Next invitation is for those of you that might need prayer and encouragement. 
you've come to the right place, this place is a place where it's okay to not be okay, or you, you might need some encouragement, or maybe you just got some questions about Jesus, feel free right now. This is some moments for you. Just step out to the aisle and make your way to the care room, and we'll have volunteers who would love to pray with you or get you answers that you may be seeking. Amen. Awesome. Father God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your cross and for the empty tomb and the hope that we are left with in light of it. Go with us now and help us not to live lives that just with our lips say we believe in resurrection, but with our whole lives genuinely, we are a people that believes in resurrection. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people say together, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Have a great week. We'll see you next week for No Other Name Part 3.